It's time for episode 142 of Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, and we're going to profile a man who's come up in several conversations over the last few months, James Matosi. Let me introduce myself. I'm Whistlekick's founder, but better known as your host on this show, Jeremy Lesniak. Whistlekick makes the best sparring gear you can buy, as well as some great apparel, fun accessories, and a bunch of other good stuff for practitioners and fans of traditional martial arts. I'd like to welcome all of you new listeners and thank all of you that have come back to spend more time with me today. All our past episodes, show notes, and some other good stuff is available at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. No hyphens or anything in there. From that site, you can sign up for a newsletter. Please do so. It's how we stay engaged with our audience. We offer exclusive content to the people on the newsletter list. We send you discounts. It's the only place to find out about upcoming guests. Really, it's a win-win for everybody. It's holiday season. We've sent out, you know, a couple newsletters out of schedule, but usually it's like one or two a month. Today's episode, if you head on over to the website, has a full transcript, and we've also got some old photos of our subject. You know, we've mentioned the apps that we offer for this podcast, but have you spent any time to check them out? They're available for both iOS and Android. You can get them at the respective app stores. Now, why should you? If Martial Arts Radio is the primary podcast you listen to, these apps are custom-tuned to give you the best experience. If you already have an app you like, don't sweat it. But for those of you that don't, give them a shot. They're free. We've heard now from two people that knew the late, great James Matosi personally, Hanchi Bruce Jutnik and Grandmaster Rick Alamany. You may not have recognized that name, though. So we thought it was a good opportunity to put forth a profile of the man. It's a good bet that even if you don't know it, your martial arts life has been touched by this man. Masayoshi Matosi, who later took the name James, was born in Hawaii, 1916. At age four, his mother brought him to Japan with his two sisters for their formal education and upbringing by their grandfather. This training included everything from religion to anatomy, language, philosophy, and kenpo. After his training and some time to reflect, he returned to Hawaii in 1935. Shortly after he started teaching in 1936, he became friends with Robert Trias, the karate legend who founded the first karate school on the mainland of the U.S., and on this show is best known as the instructor for Grandmaster Victor Moore, who appeared here on episode 20. He gave his style several names during his lifetime, including Shorinji Kenpo, Kenpo Jiu-Jitsu, and finally, Kosho Shoriru Kenpo. Kenpo is a Japanese version of the Chinese term Chuan Fa, which means way of the fist. Kosho Shoriru Kenpo can be translated as Old Pine Style of Fist Law, according to James Matosi's son, Thomas Barrow Matosi, who is still alive and practicing. After the attack on Pearl Harbor in 1941, Matosi jumped to enlist in the National Guard, signing up only 24 hours after the bombing. It was only three weeks later he was honorably discharged and then interned at Sand Island, a camp on the north side of Oahu. Formerly known as Quarantine Island and Cush Island, it lies at the entrance to Honolulu Harbor. More than 600 Hawaiian residents were housed there during the two years the camp was open. It's part of our American history we don't like to talk about, but it's something that we do need to remember. Now, despite all this, after his release in 1942, Matosi spent most of the war teaching his martial art to American civilians in case of a Japanese invasion. Talk about knowing where your loyalties are. No traitorous actions in this man. During that whole time, he worked as an herbalist and was known as a wonderful healer, as well as the owner of a brothel. During his time teaching in Hawaii, the demanding system he taught yielded only six black belts, including Thomas Young and William Chow. It was Chow who went on to teach Ed Parker, Manny Dela Cruz, Ralph Castro, and others that you may have heard of. He was one of the first to instruct people of any ethnic background, a rarity at a time when most instructors kept their arts within their own heritage. On Hawaii, it was primarily Okinawan martial arts, and really, they were only passing them to other Okinawans or people of Okinawan descent. Which is kind of interesting, because though he denies the influence, it seems really clear from his books and the art of Kempo itself that there was Okinawan martial arts influence on Matosi and the way he practiced and taught. In his book, What is Self-Defense?, Matosi references Mutsu Mizuhu, even calling him his teacher. Mizuhu wrote a book titled Karate Kempo in 1933. 
Some say Matosi's book, which was written in 1947, published in 1953, is the first English karate book written. He didn't do all the English himself, his students helped him, but still quite an accomplishment, especially when you consider how many English martial arts books there are today. Matosi was known to have taught only one kata, or form, at his school, and it's one that survives today in various forms. A lot of you have probably heard it. Uh, many of you probably have done it in some form or another. Nahanshi, sometimes called Nahanshin. He was also a big fan of the Makawara, a traditional Okinawan hand conditioning tool. We've got a photo of that, of him working with one over on the website. And so here we see even more of the Okinawan influence on Matosi that he liked to deny. In 1953, James Matosi stopped teaching regularly, passed his school over to Thomas Young, and moved to Southern California where he taught a few students privately. There's speculation as to why he stopped running his school and moved, even among his family, with the most believed notion being that he felt his students were unwilling to dedicate enough of their lives to the art to satisfy him. Another theory says that there was an accidental death of one of his students caused by another student during class, and that led him to believe that his followers were too focused on the aggressive side of Kempo, ignoring the philosophical elements that had been so important during his childhood in Japan. In 1974, he was arrested in Los Angeles on the charges of murder and extortion related to crimes committed by one of his students, Terry Lee. There was conflicting testimony during the trial, and even the court admitted that Matosi's testimony, conducted in Japanese because he struggled with English, was translated improperly. The only thing Matosi admitted to during the trial was being Lee's martial arts instructor, maintaining his innocence until his death. Lee claimed that Matosi had asked him to commit the murder several times because the victim, Mr. Namamatsu, owed Matosi money. Matosi was sentenced to life in prison and served most of his term at Folsom State Prison in Folsom, California. Lee, the one who actually conducted the murder, on the other hand, received only three years in exchange for his testimony against Matosi. The level of Matosi's involvement in the murder is still debated today. During his incarceration, Matosi attempted to pass on his knowledge, first to his son, Thomas Barrow Matosi, who originally refused to accept his father's teachings. Obviously, he is doing so now. He is passing on the knowledge and is considered the current reigning, if that's the right title, grandmaster for Matosi's Kempo. Later, verbally, Matosi instructed four men, two of whom have been on the show. Hanji Bruce Jutnik and Grandmaster Rick Alamany. The other two, Ray Arkila and Eugene Sedano. Matosi referred to them as, quote, honorable masters one through four. James Matosi later died in 1981 in prison of complications from diabetes. So there we have it. James Matosi, his influence, and really, I think, a throwback to a time of martial arts that was steeped in family heritage. We saw that at the beginning. And what we didn't get into, because it's it's kind of hard to put this forth in a podcast, but if you read any of his writings, you'll see how important the philosophical side, the almost spiritual side of martial arts was to James Matosi. It's hard to pick up his books. They've been out of print for decades. And if you can find a used copy, it's probably going to be a hundred bucks. So it's on my wish list, uh, my Amazon wish list. So hoping to pick up a couple copies. I have some friends that have them that may let me uh, look through them from time to time. So I have had a chance to, to briefly look through them and they're, they're impressive books. Now, is there any Kempo in your martial arts lineage? Have you had the chance to work with any of the first or second generation Kempo masters that trained under Matosi or maybe were influenced by him? How about your thoughts on such an influential martial arts legend. I want to know what you think. And you can post your thoughts in the comments at the website, we'll look at martialartsradio.com or over on Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, YouTube, Instagram. Just search for Whistlekick. We'll come right up. If you want to be a guest on the show, or maybe you've got an idea for a show topic, go ahead, fill out the form on the website. And don't forget to subscribe to our newsletter so you can stay up on everything we've got going on. You can learn more about our products at whistlekick.com. That's all for today. Until next time, Train hard, smile, have a great day.